Welcome everyone. I'm thrilled to have you all join us this afternoon for an important discussion. My name is Nidhi Hegde and I'm the Managing Director of the American Economic Liberties Project. We're an organization dedicated to challenging consolidated corporate power across the economy. We're grateful to host this event today with a diverse group of 13 local and national organizations showing the breadth of interest and support for the updated draft merger guidelines. And you will have a chance to hear directly from a number of our partners later in the program. But I am very honored to have two incredible leaders of antitrust join us today who need no introduction. Federal Trade Commission Chair Lena Khan and Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust Jonathan Cantor. Their leadership is ushering in a new era of antitrust enforcement that promises to make our markets more vibrant, innovative, and balanced, ultimately benefiting businesses, workers, and consumers. The FTC and DOJ recently released updated merger guidelines. This is arguably one of the most important developments in antitrust law in over a decade. These guidelines bring in new learning and evidence from a number of stakeholders and are a reflection of today's economic realities as markets have evolved. Since the FTC and DOJ announced the draft guidelines just a few short weeks ago, and it's open for public comment, they've already heard from hundreds of healthcare workers, writers, farmers, and others who've been affected by big corporate mergers. These first-hand accounts of how people are experiencing the economy, feeling the impact of policy choices that have been made are important in informing new rules and regulations. And we at Economic Liberties have created a website called Share Your Merger Story that you can use to submit your experience. You'll find it in the chat. So I've been reading these comments and I just wanna highlight one that really stuck with me. It was from a nurse who described not only the harms that mergers had caused on her own industry, through lower wages and forced retraining, fewer job options, but also how broader consolidation across airlines, the cell phone industry and more has raised prices so high that it was now hard to make ends meet and just left her feeling powerless. The FTC and DOJ's work intends to shift this current power imbalance between large corporations and everyone else. And we'll hear directly from Chair Khan and AAG Cantor on why these guidelines matter and how they will inform the work of the antitrust agencies. So without further ado, let's get to the main show. I'd like to introduce our director of research, Matt Stoller, who will moderate a fantastic conversation with Chair Lena Khan and Assistant Eight Attorney General Jonathan Kendra. Thank you. Matt, over to you. Thanks for the, thanks for the kind introduction. And um, it is an absolute honor to have the two of you here to talk. So just to start off the basic question, there's a pretty broad consensus uh, that the economy is very different than it used to be. And the way that our government law enforcers uh, should approach laws to promote fair competition in markets needs to keep up. So in a recent piece in the Journal of Antitrust Enforcement, Jonathan, you called the current situation with digital markets a quote unquote generational challenge for enforcers. So, so with that in mind, uh, last month, the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division released these new merger guidelines. Wall Street, among lawyers who handle this area of law, there's a lot of excitement, anger, frustration, um, opportunity, everything in between. But can you explain in normal language, if you're a small business owner or worker, consumer, farmer, engineer, uh, whatever, whatever you are, if you're, if you're not in the antitrust world, what are these new merger guidelines and um, why do they matter? So thanks so much. Um, Matt and, and Nidhi for, for having us. Um, I'm happy to kick it off, Jonathan. Um, that's cool with you. We can just go back and forth. Um, so it's a great question, Matt. And it's absolutely true that these merger guidelines, which are basically like our enforcement manual, can seem pretty arcane. Um, and a key goal of ours has to been to make sure that we're hearing directly from people. Because at the end of the day, which mergers go through and which ones do not can be hugely consequential for people's lives. Um, in a day-to-day -day sense, it can mean that whereas you previously had to drive five miles to access a hospital, now after a merger, you might have to instead drive 50 miles. Uh, if you're a worker, it can mean that your new employer has more power over you, and so they can use that power to freeze your wages or make your schedule less predictable. Um, if you're a business, it can mean that the supplier that used to offer you a competitive rate is now able to jack up prices. So at the end of the day, it has huge implications for people's lives because mergers are about what options exist in the marketplace and what types of choices you do or don't have. 
And so Congress charged both the FTC and the antitrust division with preventing mergers that may substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. And so it's the job of our agencies to really be screening for the types of deals that they can have those negative effects um, to make sure that we're having a, 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 an economy and, and sets of markets that are characterized by open and fair competition so that everyday people can have choices uh, in their day-to-day -day lives, be it as a customer, be it as a worker, or be it as, as a business. Yeah. Um, that completely agree with everything Shere Khan said. I think there are two um, important aspects of this. First is what we're saying. And the second is how are we saying it? And so as building on what Shere Khan said, um, competition today looks very different um, than it might have looked in 1950 or 1960. Um, and so um, how competition presents itself um, is going to be different today than it was in the past. And I think the one of the challenges we've confronted in antitrust law is that we've often started our questions with very technical um, assumptions. Is the merger vertical or is the merger horizontal? Uh, but if you're a farmer, or if you're a small business owner, or if you're a large business owner who wants to get uh, inputs at a good price, sometimes, um, one, you're not necessarily thinking in those terms. Uh, but two, today's markets are far more complex than they used to be. Um, and competition can come from a lot of different ways and a lot of different forms. And so it's really important that we start our inquiry with an important question, which is how does competition in this market work? What are the, what are the dimensions of competition? Is there competition for labor? Is there competition for a platform? Is there competition for privacy? All of these things are really important. We have to start with that foundational question. Once we understand how competition presents itself in the market, then we can explore whether the merger may substantially lessen that competition. Uh, but it's really important that we break free from some of these um, boxes or narrow rigid structures that we've um, put ourselves in, uh, but that the law doesn't necessarily require us to, uh, uh, to do. Second is how we're saying it. Um, and one of the things I've heard a lot uh, in my time as an antitrust practitioner and certainly in this position is that words matter and that um, words can be exclusionary. And so antitrust law has developed into um, often a very technical discipline uh, that can be very um, difficult for people who don't have certain kinds of backgrounds to participate in, even when those uh, people are affected by mergers, and even when um, they actually have a better understanding of their business um, than even um, uh, the agencies. And so um, what we've tried to do is develop these guidelines so that they're accessible, so that you can look at the first five pages and say, okay, what are the issues I'm looking for? Of course, every inquiry is going to be more in-depth. It's going to require um, specific investigation, but, but the Antitrust is for the people, and it requires participation from people, not just inside the beltway. Um, and if we're going to invite that participation, we need to start breaking down the barriers by using language that is more participatory. Thanks. Uh, so I, I know you guys got a lot of comments from normal people when you were putting these guidelines together, but I want to ask just, uh, so, so Chair Khan, you talked about this as sort of the guidebook for how you do enforcement. So could you walk us through how these guidelines could affect a murderer? And I guess, I mean, you mentioned it briefly, but what is the authority, the legal authority that you actually have to address mergers? So Congress has passed a set of antitrust laws, um, each one of which talks about, you know, issues relating to market power. The statute that most directly talks about mergers is the Clayton Act, and Section 7 of the Clayton Act prohibits mergers whose effect may be to substantially lessen competition or to tend to create a monopoly. So this is a clear directive from Congress. Um, Congress made a decision to prioritize competition over consolidation. And we, as the antitrust enforcers, are charged with administering that statute and vindicating that goal that Congress has laid out in this law. Practically, what our guidelines do is lay out a whole set of ways that mergers could violate the Clayton Act 
and we lay out, you know, 12 different ways um, specifically that mergers could do that. And we wanted to make sure that we're laying out very clear templates um, that make it very clear and accessible to everybody, to all market participants. What are some of the different ways that mergers can do that? Um, some of what the, the guidelines specifically talk about, for example, are the ways that mergers can lessen competition not just on the customer side when people are interacting with businesses as consumers, but also on the supplier side, including for workers. And so we want to make sure that the market participants and the public knows that we will be assessing mergers to see if they're reducing competition, not just for consumers that are buying goods, but also for workers. We lay out in the guidelines some of the specific ways in which labor markets are different. Right. In the same way that you might be able to kind of, you know, go to different stores to buy a toaster, switching jobs is different. Right. It takes more work. There are switching costs. And so there are just certain dimensions of how competition works in labor markets that are different than when you're just acting as a consumer. So we wanted to lay out some of that analysis and make it clear what are some of the types of factors that we'll be looking at? What are some of the different ways that mergers that reduce uh, mergers that reduce competition for workers can can harm workers. That can include the ability of an employer to reduce or freeze wages, but it can also include the, the power of the company to cut benefits, uh, to make one's working schedule much less predictable. Uh, we got a whole set of comments from worker organizations and unions, and they noted that Having some sense of predictability over one's schedule is really important as a worker. And so one thing that they've seen is that after some of these mergers, that's a dimension of workplace quality that can really suffer. So we go in through in some detail, what are some of the different factors that we'll be looking at? Um, in addition, another guideline specifically talks about serial acquisitions. And so this is when you might have a whole set of mergers no single one of which may rise to the level of posing competition problems, but in the aggregate, these serial acquisitions can sometimes result in a, a wholesale roll-up of a particular market or a particular sector. So particularly in healthcare, for example, we've heard a lot about these types of roll-up strategies or serial acquisitions relating to physician practices or other types of services. And so we wanted to make sure that the public and market participants knew that we are going to be looking at some of these acquisitions in the aggregate, um, that we're not just limited and having to look at them one by one by one, because we want to make sure that we're not missing the forest for the trees. And again, that our analysis is matching the reality of how businesses are competing um, rather than just relying on, you know, two dimensional models and theories that are not actually reflecting the reality of how the market is working. So those are just a couple of examples of specific areas that the guidelines touch on that we want to make sure is reflecting the realities of, of the economy today. So, um, Jonathan, just a question for you. I mean, it, it sounds like these guys are, you know, and, and from a lot of the coverage that I've seen from CNBC and a lot of the lawyers, you guys are going to be stopping all mergers pretty much. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong when I when I ask, like, how many mergers are, is, is this actually going to going to affect? Yeah. So I think that let's, I want to be very clear about this. Uh, our job is to enforce the law. We're law enforcers and we only enforce the law and to block a merger when the merger violates the law. That's frankly somewhat rare, particularly in, if you think about all the mergers that occur uh, on a, a yearly basis. It's a small fraction that get an investigation. Look at all, even smaller fraction that get deep investigation, even smaller fraction that get challenged. Our goal is to have a clear statement of our agency practice so that uh, companies, one, understand how we go about doing our investigations. Uh, but two, the more transparency we can provide, um, the more we can avoid having to go to block mergers because um, uh, we're not getting mergers that propose to us that are problematic. And so I think a lot of the, um, the you know, hysteria is perhaps overblown. Um, uh, we are not blocking every merger. We can't. Uh, we only block the ones that violate the law. And the Supreme Court, Congress have laid out how the law should be applied. And that's our job is to do that faithfully and to do it 
um, when we believe it's in the best interest of vindicating um, the rights of the public. So, so then a small fraction of mergers get investigated, a smaller fraction get investigated even further, and an even smaller number get checked. Absolutely, that- thousands of filings a year. I don't think you, you know, there's certainly not thousands of challenges. I think one of the things that we've observed is that over the last two years, as the administration has uh, continued to enforce the law, um, that there are fewer problematic mergers that are coming to us in the first place, and that's the that's a win win. Uh, it's the best case scenario where um, where the, the problematic mergers aren't coming to us at all. Now, I wish I could say that. Uh, we've we've we eliminated those mergers entirely. We haven't, um, but and, you know we are here to make sure that we are enforcing the law effectively. But to go back to the first part of our conversation today, we need to enforce it in light of market realities. And so today's market realities present differently um, we've, uh, than in the past. We've learned a lot, uh, and we competition today is you know comes in lots of different forms and sizes. And so we need to understand that and make sure that we're addressing the root cause of a problem. Okay. So so a lot of a lot of people sort of put these merger guidelines on on um, the political leadership of the agency, but these were really the full agency were putting these guidelines together. You got a lot of comments. Um, so how mm-hmm. important our public comments in this process? How did your agencies understand them? Um, how did they incorporate them into the new guidelines? And then can people still offer their thoughts on the draft guidelines that you've put out? Thanks for asking the question, Matt. So you're absolutely right. We received thousands and thousands of public comments. Uh, those were incredibly important to us. We went through each of them and, and our staff read all of them very closely to make sure that we were understanding directly what the public's experience had been of mergers and acquisitions. Um, the AAG and I also did a series of listening sessions with market participants from across the country. So we heard from people who work in healthcare. We heard from farmers and others who work in food and agriculture. We heard from people who work in the entertainment industry, from people who work um, in all sorts of sectors. Um, Again, because we want to make sure that we are acknowledging that we as enforcers in D.C. can have blind spots. And the best ways for us to be mitigating those blind spots is to be hearing directly from the people that day in, day out are working in these markets that have seen firsthand the effects that mergers and acquisitions have had. Um, So we wanted to make sure we were having a very robust process for public input and public participation. Um, As we were drafting these guidelines, we also wanted to make sure that we were making use of the expertise that our staff has. And so we had a drafting team made up of staff from both of our agencies. We worked closely with our staff to make sure we were fully pressure testing these guidelines um, as we're thinking about, um, you know, to avoid any unintended consequences. And now as we put them out, we're again collecting public comment uh, for 60 days um, started once we rolled them out. So we'll be collecting them through September 18th or so. And those comments, again, are going to be incredibly important to us because we want to hear people's reactions uh, to the draft guidelines. And then we'll have an opportunity to make any revisions that we think are necessary before moving forward with finalizing them. So should people comment now? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. And Jonathan? What, or, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So um, it's a vital part of the process. Um, as Chair Khan indicated, we, we can't enforce law effectively unless we understand how it affects people, how it affects citizens, how it affects businesses, how it affects competitors, how it affects workers. Um, And so uh, if we're not asking uh, and we're not listening uh, to the broader public, then we're not doing our jobs appropriately because it's really important for us that we understand uh, the real world implications of mergers. And so that's a really important part of that. Uh, Also, as Chair Khan indicated, we spent a lot of time um, not just uh, listening to our staff, but including them in the drafting process understanding you know, what is a fair representation of current agency practice? Uh, what are the areas of the law that um, we need to enforce effectively and develop tools and toolkits uh, and guidelines to help ensure that we are, again, accurately reflecting market realities? And so 
Um, these, this draft is the end product of, of a lot of work from a lot, a lot of people, by a lot of people, with input from a lot of people. Uh, but it's also just a draft, and the comment period is essential. Um, we um, are already receiving a lot of really great comments. We're already reading them, uh, and they're raising op opportunities for us to make improvements and adjustments. And so um, not only are we are li listening, we're listening attentively, uh, and the voice of public comments matter. And we're not just looking at the public comments that come in from a corporation or a law firm. We're reading the comp comments that come in from citizens, people who are directly affected by concentration. Uh, and they are um, moving, inspiring, and thought provoking. Okay, so um, so this, this is a long process. You guys have been working on this for uh, years now. I was in the Biden administration executive order in um, in 20, July 2021. And part of the reason it takes a long time is because it's really important. You don't just make these changes on a dime. But um, can you give us a sense of where in the process we are in terms of uh, getting these these um, guidelines finalized, and do you have a rough timeline as to when they will be finalized and and when um, when they will go into effect? Well, look, we're acting with a lot of urgency because we recognize that this is an important document, but that importance also means that we need to take care to get it exactly right. So we're gonna be collecting public comments through September 18th. Uh, we're gonna go through a rigorous process to make sure we're fully absorbing and digesting all of that input and feedback. And then we'll be moving you know, thoughtfully and carefully, but also with urgency to, to finalize these as soon as we, we can. So uh, the, the Biden administration has centered its strategy in a number of areas on industrial policy, um, reshoring manufacturing of semiconductors, batteries, electric vehicles. It's also gotten into artificial intelligence as well as trying to address healthcare costs, a whole range of areas where they're trying to, uh, to think about political economy in a different way, sort of updating priors. Um, how do these merger guidelines and, and fair competition more broadly uh, affect and, and work in this overall policy agenda? Yeah, so it's, you know, I think it's important to start with the, you know, the, the foundation, which is antitrust is a matter of law enforcement. Um, and so Congress writes laws, we enforce the laws, um, and courts interpret the law. And, you know, first and foremost, our job is to make sure that we are doing so in a way that's faithful um, to, to the statute and faithful to the statute as interpreted by courts. And Congress made a very important value judgment, which is that competition is important. Uh, that competition is not only something that matters to our industrial policy, but Congress was quite clear that it matters to our freedom. And so it created antitrust laws starting with the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act, which has now been updated multiple times. And it's important for us to enforce those laws to protect competition, the competitive process, so that we can get all the benefits that flow from that. I think there's um, you know, broad ranging recognition and competition benefits workers. You know, there's competition, you can get a better salary, you get better benefits. You can get more opportunity to work where you want to work, for whom you want to work. Competition can benefit consumers with lower prices. Competition can benefit innovation and opportunity by providing avenues to create a business, um, which, uh, uh, and, and have that business succeed because there are lanes available um, to, to be um, effective. And so, you know, there are, are so many different benefits of competition, um, but at the end of the day, you know, and, and so the Biden administration's executive order quite profoundly and importantly they, um, decided to weave in competition policy to many aspects of our government. Um, and we work with our agency partners across the federal government to ensure that competition uh, is something that is top of mind when there are regulations, when there are rules, and other agency practices. That is, of course, distinct from individual enforcement actions. Individual enforcement actions often pursue the same goals, uh, but they do so in a way that's enforcing the law, again, as written by Congress. Another key effect of competition can be greater resiliency. 
right? So if you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket, you're not concentrating risk. And so greater competition can also mean more diversification and more diversification of risk uh, in ways that can make sure that our markets and our economy is more resilient, especially in moments of certain types of disruptions or crashes that otherwise can have a really cascading effect. So I think as policymakers are thinking about how do we best position the U.S., both our economy um, and our markets to, to withstand, withstand shocks, um, competition policy can be a really important tool as part of that. Okay, so last question. Uh, can you give us like a, situate what, what is happening historically? So how have the guidelines um, been, when were they first created? How have they been changed? Uh, and what do changes in guidelines generally mean? Yes, yeah, so the guidelines are designed to keep pace with um, with the law, and they're designed to keep pace with industry realities. They were first written in 1968, updated again in 1982, 1984, 1992, 1997, uh, 2010, and then uh, partial update in 2020. Um, and so, when we undertook this process, we did uh, we asked ourselves some important questions. First is where is the state? What is the state of the law? Um, and make sure that we build our guidelines around because it's a document that gives us a framework for how we investigate and ultimately um, helps guide law enforcement. Um, it's important to stay rooted in the law. And then it's important to stay rooted in economic realities. And so again, if we think about how markets function today with platforms, and data, um, how uh, uh, workers are affected and by, by concentration, uh, we've learned a lot and we've seen a lot. And so it's important that we write the guidelines in a way that actually um, gives us a blueprint to be effective in our enforcement. Uh, that's the challenge. And there have been periodic updates. And this is another one. Um, and we think um, one that is faithful to the law and market realities. Well, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I would love to uh, hand us off to my colleague, Morgan Harper. Um, who is our Director of Policy and Advocacy. Thank you so much for what you do and um, for the um, uh, amazing work and inspirational leadership that you've offered for the last several years. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you again to Assistant AG Cantor and Chair Khan for joining us and providing some of that background on this merger guidelines process. So we're turning to our next phase of the program, which will feature uh, remarks from lots of our partners, though not all. We have so many great partners who have been part of this event, but a subset of them will pro be providing their views on the impacts of some of you know, the mergers that they're seeing among the constituencies that they represent and serve, and then also their initial thoughts on these guidelines. Because as we heard in the, in the discussion that just happened, there really is the intention for this updating in the merger guidelines process to reflect the whole suite of experiences that are happening across the country by workers, businesses, and all of us as consumers. So with that, we'll get right to it. We have a lot of speakers, but they are all great. So hang on. Um, but first, we're going to start with Grace Garcia, who is a Vons employee and a member of UFCW Local 770. Grace? Hi. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Grace Garcia, an essential grocery store worker at Vons in Glendale, California, and a proud USCW 770 member with 32 years of service in the grocery industry. I support the US Department of Justice and the FTC proposed updated merger guidelines to more accurately reflect the reality that workers and consumers face when these multi-billion dollar deals happen. I would like to talk about all the hardships that me and my coworkers went through because of the Albertsons and Safeway merger in 2015. In fact, eight years ago, I experienced firsthand the pain of losing my job. This experience did not only affect me, but it also affected my children and family. Thousands of workers across the country were laid off at the time due to the company's poor planned and execution of the merger, which led to about 150 divested stores. Many of them shut down. I personally didn't have a job for three months and losing my job was extremely difficult for me and my family. The uncertainty of not knowing what was going to happen next was very stressful and I didn't know how I was going to pay my rent and feed my children as a single mother. I was only able to pull through 
these challenging, challenging times with the support of my family. My mom and my sister helped me through out financially, but other workers weren't so lucky. My many friends and coworkers could not find a job and struggled to put food on the table and pay rent. Some lost their homes and others had their cars repossessed. Many of them had to take temporary odd jobs like cleaning houses to be able to survive. Consumers also, also suffered. When Hagen, the company that purchased the divested stores took over, the food prices went up. Customers just stopped shopping at the store because they just could not afford to buy their groceries. When I was fin finally able to find a job at Vaughn's, I had to take a demotion and a pay cut. I went from making $18 an hour as a cashier to $15.75 working in their Starbucks kiosk. I definitely don't want to go through that struggle again, and I don't want to see customers struggling either. As many of my coworkers, our unions, and hundreds of other organizations and thousands of individuals have already commented in opposition of proposed mega merger of Albertsons and Kroger, I stand in solidarity that the opposition and appreciate the FTC's thoughtful review of the proposal under the current rules, hope they reject the proposal. Back to the point of today's discussion and the future of our proposal mergers, I feel that the drafted updated guidelines will be even more powerful to have the government protect workers and consumers to the, of the future. To the Thank you for working on the updated merger guidelines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. As Chair Khan mentioned in, in some of her remarks, I think one of the focus areas on labor and having the voice of labor included um, in this consideration of a, updating the guidelines is so important. And we're so grateful to have UFCW as part of a part of our presentation today. Next, we will turn to Joe Van Wy from Farm Action. Thank you, Morgan, and the rest of the team at AELP for hosting today's rally. My name is Joe Van Wy, Policy and Outreach Director at Farm Action. We work to revitalize our nation's rural communities, restoring competition and dismantling monopoly power across America's food system. First, I would like to thank Chair Lena Khan and Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Cantor for publishing these new merger guidelines and delivering on the promises of President Biden's executive order to reinvigorate antitrust enforcement and hold corporate bad actors accountable. For decades, our enforcers have been asleep at the wheel. We have been forced to sit by and watch as the largest agrochemical companies, grocery chains, and meat packers carried out scores of clearly anti-competitive acquisitions, scaling up their market power and then leveraging it to crush competitors and deprive hardworking farmers and ranchers of the fair value of their products. However, because of the leadership of this administration's enforcers, we have seen the rule of law restored. These guidelines mark a turning point in our approach to antitrust enforcement and are proof positive that corporate America's deals that deplete our rural communities are now going to receive the scrutiny they deserve. Deals like the disastrous 2014 merger of grocery giant Safeway and Albertsons, one that should never have been allowed in the first place. The proposed remedy, divestiture of just under 200 stores, was an abject failure that ultimately led to many of the divested stores being acquired by Albertsons anyway. Workers like Ms. Garcia faced diminished opportunities as stores closed. The new firm's buyer power drove farmers' share of the food dollar even lower and removed access to markets altogether for producers who could not meet the new giant's demand for scale. And the deal furthered the troubling trend of dominant retail grocery firms vertically integrating up the supply chain, exerting control over the food system at all stages of production and processing. Farm Action is confident that in 2023, under these new guidelines and with AAG Cantor and Chair Khan at the helm, a deal like Safeway Albertsons would have been stopped in its tracks. It clearly increased concentration significantly in a market that was already highly concentrated. It clearly threatened to eliminate and did eliminate competition between the two giants for customers. And it most certainly lessened competition for workers or other sellers, namely the farmers and ranchers who lost access to markets or who saw prices for their products go down because of Albertson's enhanced buyer, buyer power. We believe that these new guidelines offer a clear path towards preventing future deals that would further consolidate our food system. 
Uh, once again, I'd like to thank AELP for hosting today's event. Uh, I'd like to thank Chair Khan and Assistant Attorney General Cantor for their trailblazing work. And thanks to everyone with us today, standing up for a vibrant, competitive economic landscape for American farmers, ranchers, workers, consumers, and small businesses. Thanks so much, Joe. Really appreciate those remarks and making sure we have the perspective of farmers and ranchers included in this conversation. Next, we will turn to Natalie Foster uh, from the Economic Security Project. Natalie? Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. And thank you to AELP Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Cantor and FTC Chair Lena Khan for this fantastic event. We are so pleased to be among so many of our partners in this field today. I'm Natalie Foster, the president and co-founder of Economic Security Project, an ideas advocacy organization that builds economic power for all Americans. We entered the anti-monopoly movement because we believe that fighting concentrated corporate power is vital to creating an economy that works for everyone. And that is why we were so excited to see the update of the merger guidelines a proposal that marks the end of neoliberalism and the advent of Bidenomics. The merger guidelines bring us back to the original intention of antitrust enforcement, which is to protect entrepreneurs, small businesses, and working people against the destructive impacts of monopoly power. These revised guidelines restore the government's role in making sure that markets are competitive and that they benefit the public. The comprehensive, rigorous approach outlined in these guidelines is grounded in facts. It reflects the latest empirical evidence of monopoly harms, including research that we've instigated and supported that have shown why we must promote policies that support fair competition. We need policies that challenge the increasingly aggressive strategies pursued by corporations to preserve their monopoly power. The FTC and the DOJ have listened to the anti-monopoly movement's call to action, and they're taking bold steps to restore fair and competitive markets. The proposed guidelines are part of a larger agenda that we have to advance. It's critical that we continue to listen to the communities most harmed by monopoly power, workers, as Grace spoke to so beautifully in her opening comments, communities of color, small businesses, and families. We have to develop policies that restore their agency in the marketplace. Policies that are responsive to the fact that some communities are impacted more than other communities. This is non-negotiable if we are to truly move closer to a genuinely inclusive multiracial democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie, for just another reminder of how personal and um, and deep the impacts of, of merger policy can be. So thank you for those comments. Next, we will turn to Laura Bloom Smith from Writers Guild of America West to provide their perspectives. Laura? Hello, thank you so much to AELP for having me today. Uh, my name is Laura Blumsmith. I'm the Research and Public Policy Director of Writers Guild of America West, a labor union representing writers of television, film, and streaming content. The FTC and DOJ's new mer draft merger guidelines are part of a deeply necessary effort to revive antitrust enforcement. Compared with earlier guidelines, the new ones are much more skeptical of the idea that mergers are the natural way for companies to grow, and they focus more on the various ways that mergers hurt competition, including how mergers impact workers. For screen and television writers, this is a moment that highlights the urgency of including writer concerns in every element of antitrust enforcement. Harmful mergers and attempts to monopolize markets are a recurring theme in the history of media and entertainment, and they are a key part of what led 11,500 writers to go on strike more than 100 days ago against their employers. Companies like Disney, Amazon, Netflix gained power through anti-competitive consolidation and vertical integration, and they've used their leverage to undervalue writers and writing, even as they make billions off of writers' work. 
They've imposed more and more precarious working conditions, increasingly short-term employment, and lower pay for writers and other workers across the industry, going so far as to threaten the sustainability of writing as a profession. These conditions became so dire and employers so unresponsive to writer concerns that writers had no choice but to strike over these issues. In the framework of the guidelines, this is what inadequate labor market competition looks like. And when this strike ends, we will still need strong, aggressive merger guidelines and enforcement of them. Wall Street continues to push for more consolidation among our employers, despite the industry's history of mergers that failed to deliver any of the consumer benefits they'd claimed that left writers and audiences worse off with less diversity of content and fewer choices. More mergers would leave writers with even fewer places to sell their work and tell their stories, and the remaining companies would have even more power to lower pay and worsen working conditions. Strong enforcement against harmful mergers is essential to protect workers in media and in industries across the country, and these guidelines are an important step in the right direction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. So grateful to have the perspective of writers today, especially with the live fight that you all have going on. I appreciate you taking time to be with us. Next, we will turn to Shonda Kowser of Main Street Alliance. Shonda? Thank you. And I just want to say thank you again to Assistant Attorney General Cantor, FTC Chair Lena Khan, for your amazing leadership, and to the American Economic Liberties Projects for organizing our town hall today. I am Shonda Causer, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of Main Street Alliance, the leading national organization for true small business owners. When we say true small business owners, we are spotlighting our solopreneurs, our mom and pop shops, and those who employ less than 50 people. Unchecked corporate power is accelerating the monopolization of many industries and is stacking the deck against Main Street. True small business owners deserve an opportunity to compete fairly. And I just wanna take a moment to tell you about Randy George who owns Red Hen Banking, Baking in Vermont. We were speaking last year around the need for pay leave for all and how those public investments can help small business owners. In his story, he shared that when he started his business in 1999, he had multiple suppliers for his baking company. Today, he has two. Um, these types of uh, policies that we're discussing here um, are so important, but I think the language is not accessible for the ordinary small business owners. When we say updated merger guidelines, the draft language, and doesn't signal a cause for action or celebration. So I wanna reframe it. When we lift up merger guidelines, what we're talking about is the right for economic prosperity and equity. So Main Street Alliance is excited to continue to, to take in comments and have our memberships in com submit comments um, because the changes will ensure that we are truly enforcing our antitrust laws and that workers and small businesses are centered in decision-making process instead of large, unaccountable corporation. It's a shame that when I go home now, my town in North Carolina and Forsyth County used to have a plethora of small businesses, but now they're gone. These businesses have been around 40, 50 years. And so what I see is large multinational corporation that looks like any town USA. So let's get those comments in and let's get this done. Thank you. Great, thanks Shonda. So important to have the perspective of small businesses in this conversation. We'll have more of that to come, uh, probably a little bit including from our next speaker, Katie Milani from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Katie? Hello, good afternoon. I uh, just wanna start again with a thanks uh, to the AOP team, to Assistant AG Cantor, Chair Lena Khan. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, again, I am um, Kane Milani. I'm the Associate Director for Policy and Advocacy with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And we are a national research and advocacy organization. And for now, nearly five decades, we've advocated for strong local economies and communities. And we believe that to achieve that, to have strong local economies and communities, we must be dismantling monopoly power and dispersing economic power broadly. And so just building off of what Shonda just said, in our research, we've cons we consistently find that monopoly power is a leading threat 
to the economic vitality of local communities and to small businesses. And this is because in large part of the last four decades, we've seen merger enforcement. It's become more and more disconnected from the law and from the reality of how our markets work. And so while we just talked about this merger guidelines, it's undoubtedly a policy area most Americans, the public have not heard of, um, but the fact of the matter this is, is consequential and has real impacts on our communities and on daily lives. And so while we as LSR, Institute for Local Self-Reliance, we have suggestions on ways that the um, draft guidelines can be strengthened, we do strongly support the overall direction and the approach that uh, the FTC and DOJ has have both taken. And we believe that once they're finalized, it'll set our nation on a new path and restructure our economy. I just want to drive home before closing three points that we think are important. And the first one is that this is not new policy. Instead, what these draft guidelines do is they're bringing enforcement policy back in line with our strong anti-merger laws that are currently on the books. The second point we think is important is that the updated guidelines reflect the modern realities of our modern markets, including the digital marketplace and digital platforms. Uh, the new guidelines are really going to give enforcers a more effective lens at evaluating proposed mergers. It'll be directing enforcers to focus on market structure and, and broadly speaking, the long-term competitive health of our markets. And the, the last point I want to make here is that the new guidelines will not only stop runaway consolidation, but will um, open up a way for industries to become more dynamic, more competitive, and that really then that is going to invigorate new business formation. And so just to close out here, it is really important for the public to engage the FTC does and the DOJ need to hear from you that corporate America is they are already out in full swing, making the case against this important work that the DOJ and FTC are doing. And so hearing from you how monopolies, whether it's Amazon, CVS, a dollar store chain, um, how this impacts your community, uh, your business, uh, is really, those stories are really important to ensuring the guidelines are as strong as possible when they're finalized. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Katie. And seems like another good moment to remind people, sharemergerstory.org. Submit your comment now. Listen to Katie. We love it. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone's perspectives are considered as the, guide, the merger guidelines update process continues. Next, we will go to an in-state perspective, Anne Schwegel from Minnesota Farmers Union. Anne? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Anne Schweigel and I'm the, a grain farmer in Western Minnesota and the vice president of Minnesota Farmers Union, which is a grassroots organization that has represented family farmers and ranchers and rural communities since 1918. At the time of the creation of Farmers Union or uh, at the turn of the last century, farmers banded together to fight corporate monopolies then that were controlling their access to markets by the railroads. Our members have continued to identify limiting corporate control and protecting competition in the marketplace as a key priority for our organization, which is why I'm thrilled to be a part of this event today. For decades, farmers and rural communities have been increasingly squeezed by corporate monopolies. Updating the existing merger guidelines is a critical step in reining in powerful corporations and creating a level playing field for farmers, workers, and other small business owners. For too long, merger enforcement has been too lax, and MFU members have seen firsthand the harm this creates. Whether it's mega mergers like Bayer Monsanto or serial acquisitions like those by JBS, unchecked merger activity has made it challenging for family farmers to survive. Today, in part because of mergers and acquisitions, a small handful of companies control the inputs farmers rely upon to access markets that we need to sell our products. The rise of these highly consolidation, consolidated middlemen is a key reason why the farmer's share of each dollar spent on food has declined from 50% in 1952 to just 14% in 2021, the lowest on record. The draft guidelines help address these challenges by identifying vertical consolidation as a potential threat to competition recognizing that one merger might be a part of a series of acquisitions consol consolidating an, an industry, and that mergers in highly concentrated markets can substantially lessen competition. Farmers seem to make their voices heard in this process so that antitrust enforcement agencies understand the conditions on the ground 
in rural communities and within agriculture. The agencies will receive plenty of feedback from attorneys and economists about these guidelines, but they need to hear directly from those of us on the front lines of our monopoly crisis who are suffering the harms of lax antitrust enforcement and the highly concentrated economy it has created. It is stories from farmers that lead our grassroots organization to prioritize this, this issue. And it is those same stories that can help enact antitrust, enable antitrust enforcers to take the actions necessary to protect fair, open, and competitive markets. Thank you to the American Economic Liberties Project for inviting MFU to be a part of today's event. And thank you to the FTC, the DOJ, and the Biden administration for making aggressive antitrust enforcement a priority. Thank you, Anne. So happy to have you. Know your time is, is very valuable as well and appreciate you providing that perspective and pitching fellow farmers on participating in what can seem like a technocratic process, but we want as, as broad base of support and, um, and participation as possible. So thank you. Next, we will get back to the small business perspective with John Ahrensmeyer from Small Business Majority. John? Thank you, Morgan, and uh, thanks to AALP for hosting this event. Uh, also, thanks to Chair Khan and Assistant Secretary Cantor for their leadership. Um, I'm the CEO of Small Business Majority. We're a, a small business advocacy organization. Uh, we have 90,000 small business owners and independent entrepreneurs in our nationwide network. We do three things, advocacy on a variety of issues, connecting under-resourced small businesses with critical resources, and continuous research on small business needs and attitudes. Following on Chanda and Katie's comments, I want to focus on why fair, non-monopolistic -mon competition is essential to small businesses and why these proposed merger guidelines are so important to free and fair entrepreneurship. Small businesses alone do not themselves have sufficient market power to impact large businesses' behavior. So, small businesses depend on sufficient competition in larger markets to ensure competitive prices and fair business terms. For example, small businesses depend on key sales channels, such as online platforms, to market and sell their products and services. If these platforms are not competitive, they can charge excessive prices and impose onerous business terms, leaving small businesses with no alternatives. We see this play out on the biggest tech platforms, such as Amazon, Facebook, and Google. Likewise, small businesses depend on critical supply chains to create products or support the service they're selling. If those suppliers are not operating in a competitive environment, they can charge excessive prices and impose onerous business terms, leaving small businesses with no alternatives. Indeed, the same logic applies to other components in the product distribution process, such as shipping and transportation. I well, just want to cite some research that we've done um, uh, in this area. 57% um, of small businesses rely on tech products platforms to sell their products and services. 90% of them are either directly impacted by their anti-monopolistic practices and or regard their predatory and competitive practices as an important issue. 80% say that large businesses have too much control over markets that allow them to take advantage of small businesses. And 74% say that more regulations needed to stop the growth of monopolies across industries with a majority favoring breaking up larger companies. In short, small businesses depend on a healthy, robust, competitive environment to be able to function and survive. The draft merger guidelines address current gaps in limiting the development of excessive economic concentration, and for that reason, we endorse them. Thank you. Thank you, John. Appreciate your comments and, and a good transition into hearing from a specific type of small business, small independent business uh, constituency from Matt Seiler at the National Community Pharmacists Association. Matt? Thanks, Morgan. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks to ALP for hosting this event and inviting us to speak. NCPA represents America's community pharmacists, including over 19,000 community pharmacy locations who continue to suffer from the anti-competitive effects of multiple horizontal and vertical mergers over the past 20 years between pharmacy benefit managers, their upstream healthcare insurance companies like Aetna, Cigna, and United Health, and downstream pharmacies. These transactions resulted in an oligopolistic market structure that allows each vertical to exercise undue market power. Too often, merger reviews were constrained by a narrow template that resulted in regulators clearing mergers despite what was obvious to the general public, that the deals would and did result in substantial lessening of competition, higher prices, and diminished access and in, in innovation. 
We believe that the guidelines which permitted these transactions to clear without challenge by the agency subverted the intent of the antitrust statutes enacted by Congress. Our members welcome merger guidelines that consider the effect on competition and not only speculative price reductions. Like the technology space, retail pharmacy suffers from bad actors creating closed loop or walled gardens where the dominant actors establish a market and control access to the market through rules and fees that disadvantage competitors. PBMs create and exploit these walled gardens through their pharmacy networks and take it or leave it network contracts with unconscionable terms that offer below cost reimbursement are wrought with junk fees and leave access to dispute resolution unattainable to most. We applaud your efforts to issue transparent guidelines that look beyond speculative price reductions as a sole criteria of whether an agency would act. We encourage adopting guidelines that require examination of the actual effects of consummated transactions when assessing the competitive effects of the next transaction and guidelines that consider non-price effects on competition to be on par with price effects. We welcome the discussion and consideration of merge firms gaining access to competitively sensitive information about rivals. And to that point, in an industry where there are towns like Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where Express Scripts controls 91% of the commercial market, it is vitally important for patient data to become a consideration in enforcement. A vertically integrated company can simply foreclose rivals from necessary customers or other inputs. Yet the harm caused by these behaviors are not necessarily immediately quantifiable in terms of the price that the consumer pays. Often the impact of these actions is only apparent over time through a sizable reduction in the number of alternatives available to consumers and in a retail pharmacy, the creation of pharmacy deserts. <clears throat> in our industry, there is often a debate about the health of community pharmacies. NCPA believes the true answer to the question of the health of community pharmacies rests on whether the negative impacts of consolidation have led to an increase in pharmacy deserts. Therefore, NCPA encourages the agencies to further develop guidelines for consideration of non-price effects on consumers, as well as a more robust conversation about closed loop barriers and monopoly power. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. All right, we are entering our home stretch of our illustrious uh, panelists and partner list here. And next we have Ashley Woolheater from Open Markets Institute. Thanks so much, uh, Morgan, AELP, as well as all of the really excellent groups um, represented on this call. Uh, the Open Markets Institute is a team of journalists, researchers, and advocates working to break the power of corporate monopolies in order to build a stronger democracy. We believe the federal merger guidelines provide the single most important statement of how regulators view the nature of corporate power and how they'll use anti-monopoly law to help people build better jobs, better businesses, and better communities. And you've heard some from some folks firsthand how that applies. Open Markets has been calling for new merger guidelines for some time, and we eagerly welcome this first draft, which we described as a significant improvement over the current framework. The hard work by staff at DOJ and FTC to create the new set of guidelines demonstrates how serious the Biden administration is, as others have noted, about reining in the monopolies and restoring a more democratic system. We're so glad to have these allies. The new guidelines are a first real effort to rethink and restate the basic rules of competition since Ronald Reagan. It was those Reagan era guidelines that first cleared the way for private corporations to concentrate economic power and control over the rest of us. So done right, the new guidelines will give law enforcers, judges, entrepreneurs, and the public the tools we need to rein in monopolies, deconcentrate corporate control, and give independent businesses, investors, innovators, workers, the confidence that their ideas and labor won't be stolen or devalued by the biggest of the big. So now, as we've been saying on this call, it's time for all of us to read the guidelines closely and carefully prepare comments that reflect our experiences, analysis, and scholarship. We believe there's room to further, further improve the guidelines. Uh, for instance, we think they should reject any efficiency defenses uh, for presumptively illegal mergers and that the thresholds could be even clearer and lower for regulators to step in and stop the kinds of mergers that hamper fair competition in our markets, especially the deals that might in any way threaten our democracy, free speech, and other essential personal liberties. Open Markets looks forward to sharing our complete feedback soon and hope others will join us. 
Great. Thank you, Ashley. Really appreciate all the scholarship that Open Markets is, is producing on this. And last but not least, no pressure, Maria, <laughs> you're our final panelist. So you have to deliver here. Maria Langholm, <laughs> Demand Progress. Let's go. <laughs> Thanks, Morgan. Uh, and thank you to ALP and all the other groups who contributed to today's event. Thank you, of course, to Chair Khan and AAG Cantor for kicking out this conversation and for all of your ongoing leadership. Uh, as Morgan said, my name is Maria Langholt and I am Communications Director with Demand Progress. Uh, our mission is that we amplify the voice of the people and wield it to make the government accountable and contest concentrated corporate power. That's exactly why we are mobilizing in support of the proposed merger guideline, guidelines and working with our allies to do the same. The speakers before me spoke directly to so many of the harms that we're seeing from corporate consolidation. We're seeing big tech companies getting bigger and bigger. We're seeing giant grocery stores trying to execute, execute mega mergers, inevitably leading to even higher costs to meet our basic needs. Airlines are consolidating to charge higher prices for worse service and media companies are merging to squeeze out independent journalism. These new guidelines are desperately needed to reflect the current reality of multi-billion dollar cor corporate mega mergers. America's largest corporations are constantly engaging in monopolistic anti-competitive practices. They price gouge consumers, trick people into paying huge fees, treat workers unfairly unfa and take advantage of small businesses. It's time for new merger guidelines so that we can keep some of these dangerous corporate behaviors in check and stop the next mega merger. There are a lot of things about the economy and foreign policy and civil liberties and a dozen other issues that fire up our million plus grassroots members of demand progress. But recently we've seen some of the highest energy around these mega mergers. People understand that when Mega Corporation A sucks up Mega Corporation B, it's working people who end up paying higher prices, have fewer choices, and generally being locked into an economy that is less dynamic and innovative. The trend toward corporate consolidation has been underway for decades, but it has been especially pr pronounced in the recent years, and we've had enough. That's why demand progress activists are mobilizing to support modernizing the archaic guidelines and keep the final guidelines from being watered down by high-priced corporate lawyers and lobbyists. There's more that we need from states and Congress and other agencies, but there's no better place to start than with these guidelines, which will help tap the brakes on runaway monopolization throughout our economy. Every major antitrust reform in this country's long history has been authored not by bureaucrats or technocrats, but by a populist uprising. And this moment is no different. We, the people, in order to form a more perfect and dynamic economy, will offer our voice in support of stronger merger guidelines. I hope that our voices will be heard. Thank you for participating today. Thank you so much, Maria. Excellent ending. And I'm just going to briefly try to bring it all together. Um, First, I want to again thank all of our speakers and our partners, some of whom didn't necessarily participate today, but have been part of bringing this event um, to you all. We appreciate you. I also want to thank Chair Khan and Assistant Attorney General Cantor for being part of the discussion earlier with our Director of Research. And hopefully what was one of the main takeaways from this, and something that Katie actually in her remarks touched on is, you know, these merger guidelines and merger enforcement are rooted in the law, and it's a deeply historic uh, set of laws that guide how these agencies are proceeding with enforcement decisions, and that there is a message from the agencies that they want the guidelines to be accessible to the public, and that's been an effort here with this latest draft. And so I think that I agree with Maria, we should seize this opportunity. And for too long, it has been the purview of, of just lawyers and economists to consider and participate in this process. Those days, they still have a role, but those days are over to an extent. We need to hear from Grace. If you're a worker that has been directly impacted by a merger, lost your job, know what it's like to, to have to move in with a family member, you need to be participating in this process. And a farmer who is just seeing, I can, like, this is not adding up, I'm not making enough money participate in this process, submit a comment. Laura, writers who are also seeing that we can't live like this, that is reason enough to submit a comment. We've tried to make it as easy as we can for you at shareyourmergerstory.org. And we encourage you to take advantage of this historic moment to really change how we might think about moving the economy forward to ensure that it's working for workers, consumers, and small business owners across America. 
Thank you for joining us today and we'll continue to be in touch with more information on the merger guidelines.